My name is Matthew Cook, and this is a demonstration on how to race bait. First, let's talk about some of the stereotypes expressed in the 17th and 18th centuries. The vile and brutish parts of mankind. The marks of an alien race. Those were how the gentleman class described whites, poor whites to be exact, from Europe, many of whom were duped by a con game, promised an all-expense-paid trip to the New World, in return for years of free labor on the other side. Then there were those sentenced to work for five to seven years of forced labor. In the 1700s alone, over 50,000 documented white men and women were shipped to the colonies and auctioned off as labor for crimes from petty theft to trespassing or pickpocketing. A slave was considered unfortunate, not inferior. To become a slave in the ancient world was not based on skin color, but the result of being on the losing side in a war. White indentured servants 400 years ago were seen as more or less the same as African slaves. They also made easy alliances, raging against greed, unfair taxes, oppressive land use regulations, and in the 1670s, one of those alliances nearly burned Jamestown to the ground. And the last to surrender were 100 men, 80 black and 20 white. And a law enforcement system was created to give whites slightly more privileges and force a separation in their contact with blacks. This three-tiered caste system, blacks on the bottom and poor whites a notch above, now treated more favorably, made them feel as though one day they might improve their status if they just worked hard enough. And maybe some did, but most did not, especially as the life expectancy was only 35. As all rights and freedoms were taken from Africans, this new racial caste system protected the wealthy landowners, who in the South would soon become known as the masters. And if you're interested in reading more about this, there's a page-turning thriller, not exaggerating, called The People's History of the United States, which you can download as an audiobook to support this series. The creation of that three-tiered caste system is the moment the modern institution of racial slavery is born, which would brutalize, divide, and crush the spirits of black men, women, and children for the next 200 years, and give many poor whites the idea that though their lives might be miserable, at least they weren't black. Until 1863. And as Michelle Alexander writes in The New Jim Crow, former slaves had a brief moment in the sun before they returned to a state akin to slavery or worse. The unprecedented economic might of the new United States built on the backs of an enormous free slave labor force would arguably be the single greatest factor contributing to what would soon become the world's largest modern superpower. And in gratitude, instead of helping freed slaves find homes, reunite with families, or help anyone at the very least heal from a 300-year-old trauma, they were largely neglected by the North faced rampant disease, outbreaks of smallpox, cholera, many starved to death, and for the next 100 years, this thing called Jim Crow just took over for slavery. Enforced by government, courts, and law officers, forcing a continuation of an already well-established racial caste system on every aspect of American life. Ministers said whites were the chosen people, blacks cursed to be servants, God-supported racial segregation, craniologists, eugenicists, phrenologists, and social Darwinists at every educational level reinforced the belief that blacks were in every way inferior to whites. Massive social disadvantages compounded by predatory lending and housing markets and legally regulating blacks into ghettos, discriminatory bank lending practices, severe job discrimination, not to mention the lynchings, all continued until the 1960s. Now we're only talking 50 years ago. we finally have the Civil Rights Act. Black nationalism and black power, black pride. For the first time, a public promise of opportunity after three centuries of the opposite. Communities getting to police their own streets. But the black pride forces are soon struck down by the law and order movement. And what takes the place of what was once called Jim Crow? The invention of the largest prison industry in the world. In the form of new laws, tougher laws, more laws, longer sentences, mandatory minimums, more prisons, more police, and the barbaric war on drugs, which should be called the war on people. Where blacks are far more likely to be arrested for selling or possessing drugs than whites, even though whites use drugs at the same rate, and are actually more likely to sell drugs. Blacks who've committed the exact same crimes as whites are more likely to be arrested, prosecuted, more likely to have longer prison sentences. Families deprived of breadwinners and once again deprived of the right to vote. Generations sentenced to a revolving door in and out of a prison system so unstoppable 
that one out of three black men born today can expect to go to prison in their lifetime. And so despite the existence of so many notable, heroic, black, brown, and white cops saving lives and rescuing victims from unimaginable horrors across the country, righteous lawyers, wise judges, honest legislators doing great things that cannot and should never be overlooked, overall, black America has never seen a substantive break in law enforcement service to larger forces ever on the wrong side of history. Policing for petty regulatory violations like failure to use a turn signal or lacking a front license plate. And so here we are today. 30% of America are minorities, but represent 60% of the prison population. Over 1 million men and women. And so the majority of black America, 70%, understandably have little trust in law enforcement or the criminal justice system. But don't be fooled. This prison industrial complex has not only swept up black America, but all people of limited means, hunting minorities and the poor at rates higher than any other on the planet. This thing grew bigger than anyone could have imagined. It's militarized and increased in scope and aggression. And as racist as it clearly is, even if we took all the minorities out of the equation, leaving only the white majority, we would still be over-incarcerated. We would still have vile police brutality. We would still have a criminal justice system desperately in need of reform. So just like the days of early slavery, today we still have a three-tiered system. With notable exceptions, slightly more than half of black Americans graduate from high school, compared to three quarters of white Americans. And black males are twice as likely to be unemployed as white males. Moving on to the second tier, we have poor whites, treated the second worst as a whole. With many more notable exceptions, so many you think it wasn't the case, white America is also in very bad shape. The real poverty rate for the US as a whole is staggeringly close to 50%. We have a myth of social mobility that is one of the worst in the industrialized world due to decades of disinvestment from communities sending cheap labor overseas, leaving depressed, isolated local economies with no jobs, a dwindling tax base, and nothing to attract business or new residents. And why is this? As the great journalist Emily Cleath says, we should never say the word poverty without the words inequality and injustice being far behind. People become poor, not by personal failing, but because the system is engineered to push them down and keep them down. Yet despite numerous horrific incidents of police brutality and criminal injustice against whites, the beating of a homeless man or a horse thief to near death or to death, or the million whites in prison unprecedented in our nation's history, the majority of whites today, 57%, still have quite a lot, or a great deal of confidence in police and a majority think the justice system is fair. The poor whites and victims of criminal injustice and inequality are spread out across the country and heavily divided by culture and politics. The so-called liberal or conservative news media is owned by six mega media companies that control 90% of our information. Those companies are owned by the very rich. According to Forbes, the 400 wealthiest Americans today have more money than the poor half of the entire population of the United States. While less than 4% of our entire country are millionaires, they make up over half the members of Congress. Well, who do you think millionaires represent? The elite who run the country in a different revolving door of economic royalty have demonstrated certainly that they are above prosecution. So with a news media that mostly reports only on the black outrage of police brutality, which is and has been at a boiling point for the last 300 years, the white majority is confused. They make all kinds of assumptions and the white minority who are aware of the horrors of the criminal injustice system, but unaware of the history of black America, feel themselves being lumped in with the elites. When they scream at Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson and call them race baiters, they're right to scream, but they're screaming at the wrong faces. The media is terrified to let the mass of Americans know the truth about our three-tiered caste system alive and well and keeping us divided. Why do I need to identify with those ancestors before me that committed genocide and not only enslaved, but brutalized the people who in chains and in struggle for civil rights created and inspired some of the greatest art, music, culture, writing, ideas, invention, and humanity the world has ever seen. I identify with being part of that struggle. I don't need to be proud of my blood because the same color red gives life to us all. I don't need to be proud of the color of my skin because I was never told I needed to be ashamed of it. True shame is only for those who have hate in their hearts and that can be healed. I don't need to be proud of my religion because all the great religions warn us against pride. I am privileged to be a white, straight male in a society that favors those traits for which I had nothing to do with. Favors I might not even know I had. I grew up poor. 
There were a few years I was homeless, but I did not grow up black, and I was blessed in my childhood to see the difference. To paraphrase Van Jones, even in a hoodie, I look less like Trayvon than I do like Mark Zuckerberg. So along the way, in forming my identity as a human being, I choose to identify with all of humanity in a struggle for harmony. You are my ally and I am yours. I don't need to be better than someone else to feel good about myself. I need to feel the same. I acknowledge racism as existing and alive as it ever was. And in doing so, I eliminate any invented wall between us. When we ally ourselves with a movement that's been asking to just acknowledge for four odd centuries how overdue it is to just say three words, Black Lives Matter. Then united, we are a power that will shake the masters to their core. Yes, I say masters of the global economy that exploits not only our own nation but the entire planet. The masters of the commercial news, the military industrial complex, prison complex, the overwhelming majority of the government. The masters corrupted by the influence too much power has on all human beings. For injustice and inequality are one and the same. Black, brown, white, sisters, brothers. The class struggle unites us all, as it always has. And race baiters, you are exposed.